If you watched or listened to the introduction video I produced for this series on answering life's tough questions biblically, you have an idea already of how I plan to approach these questions and then answer them biblically. I gave the example of the dilemma the FBI found themselves in as it related to the production of counterfeit money and how they trained their agents not on all the counterfeits, but instead on the genuine U.S. mint currency. Once they could effectively identify the genuine, the truth, it then became a lot easier for them to identify the counterfeit. I plan to take essentially the same approach. I guarantee you when we have a solid understanding of what truth is, it will help us exponentially as we seek to determine answers regarding all the counterfeits that exist. So with that in mind, let's open our first can of worms, shall we? The first question we need to answer is simply this, what is a human? And already, I'm not sitting with you right now, but I can hear the jeering and the criticisms. What? What kind of tough question is that? What do you mean, what is a human? Now, I have no doubt that most of you listening could probably produce a biblical summary of what a human is and why. But there are six reasons why I am beginning here. Number one, the world, your friends, your family, your co-workers, those to whom you are most likely shining as a light of hope, most of them do not understand what a human is. They have no earthly clue. And that is evidenced by the way our society lives, their lives, by their normalizing of abortion, by their acceptance of lifestyle choices that run directly counter to what God designed, uh, by rampant confusion as to what a biological male is, and what a biological female is. There are children in elementary schools in this country who are permitted and encouraged to defecate in litter boxes on the days that they identify as a cat. We have lost our understanding of what a human is, and society does not have the answers. Number two of why, are we, why we're beginning with the question, what is a human? Within this series on humanity, we are going to return over and over and over again to our first two sessions of what is a human and our next session of what is the image of God in man. With those two foundational pieces set, we will gain tremendous surety as we bridge into related topics and will also gain remarkable leverage as we dismantle the counterfeits. Reason number three, being able to answer the question, what is a human, will help us define our identity as it relates to gender, our composition, our responsibilities, everything we are as humans. It seems there are no more absolutes anymore. There is no more absolute truth. Postmodern thinking has opened the floodgates for humans to decide for themselves what truth is, what reality is, what gender or species I want to identify as, what gender I want to become. Okay, understanding biblically what a human is will help us define our identity. In the way of responsibilities, God gave Adam and Eve what we call the creation mandate. They were to be fruitful, multiply, sustain the earth. And although that task became exponentially more difficult when sin entered the world, it never went away. Humans still fulfill a responsibility to subdue and sustain planet earth. Reason number four. Understanding what a human is will help us define our authority. Who has authority over me? Who or what do I have authority over? For humanity as a whole, by rejecting the authority due the Creator, we have decided for ourselves who or what we want to elevate as God in our life. For most people, it seems they just elevate themselves as the final authority. Yet the position of humans in the created order is going to inform us of a few levels of authority related to humans. And we'll see that later on as we get into Psalm 8. Reason number five, being able to answer the question, what is a human, will help us define our relationships. Vertically with God, yes, but also horizontally 
in our earthly relationships. This will inform us how to handle other races. This will inform us what marriage is. And finally, reason number six. When we embrace what a human really is, it will define numerous boundaries for us in this life. For instance, if we can define what a human is, we will be able to figure out when the life of that human begins. We will know when that life ends. But then we will also understand what is to be in the life to come, in eternity. Several world religions have an awful lot of the afterlife left to chance that supposedly we can somehow influence. But a biblical understanding of humanity will explain human life and human existence boundaries. I want to start us off in Genesis 1 and 2 in the way of laying some biblical foundation. We won't be here long today, but we will come back to these passages often enough in this study. But first, let's read Genesis 1 and verses 26 through 27, and then I will roll into chapter 2. In Genesis 1, Moses writes, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And again, we'll not dive deeply today, but here we see the creation mandate, the dominion that God gave to man over creation. We see that humans are created in the image of God and likeness of God. We also see that God created two biological genders, male and female. All of these we'll discuss in depth later, a few later on today, but most of these later on. Moving on to Genesis 2, and I'll start reading in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Go down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to the livestock and to the birds of the heaven, to the beasts of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper who was fit for him, who was suitable, who complimented him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, God took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. A lot going on here, and understandably so. This is the creation of humanity, and probably a very good place for us to start. All that was foundational. But where I want to really spend the rest of our time this morning is in Psalm 8. This is another foundational passage to our understanding of God, humanity, and all the implications that exist as a result of the relationship between creator and creation. So I'll begin reading in verse uh, 1 of Psalm 8, and I'll read the entire psalm. It's only nine verses long, so bear with me. Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. 
You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let me break down this chapter into five basic truths about God and his creation. I'll draw a few conclusions at the end, and then we'll wrap up this segment. But number one, uh, our first basic truth about God and his creation is this. God is the self-existent, completely independent creator. God has always existed. God will always exist. And he exists by his own power apart from anything else. So why create humans? Some have argued that God created humans for the sake of companionship. He needed someone to talk with and walk with in the cool of the evening. Let me say that couldn't be any further from the truth. God is in need of nothing. Several passages say this, but probably the most straightforward is in Acts 17. Uh, as Paul addresses the men of Athens at the Areopagus. Listen to what Paul says in Acts 17 and verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. In Psalm 8, consider back to what we just read. All right. Rather, as taking a position where God needs man, look what Psalm 8 says in verses 1, 3, and 5. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, verse 3, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. God is completely independent. God is completely self-existent. The creation of humanity in no way is an indication that God needed something. Again, the creator needs nothing. He is self-existent. He has always existed. Number two, God created and cares for frail humanity. The second truth about God and his creation is that God created and cares for frail humanity. This is wonderful stuff, by the way. Look back at Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, as I observe the, the stars, the moon, all the heavenly bodies, I'm considering what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him. As David is looking up at the glory of the celestial bodies, don't miss this. His awe, his wonder is not on the moon. It's not on the stars. His awe is in his questioning. How in the world, why in the world would you, God, elevate lowly mankind to the extent that you did amidst the rest of creation. You have elevated mankind above the rest of your creation. Why? This is what he stands in awe of. It's a confession of speechlessness, uh, if that makes any sense, that God would elevate mankind in the way he has chosen to. That's what David is pondering. I'm no Hebrew scholar, but... I'm aware of three Hebrew words that are commonly translated man in the Old Testament. One refers to humankind or all of humanity in general. One refers to the biological male gender. And the third refers to mankind with emphasis on his frailty, his human limitations. 
David uses that third use here in verse 4, by the way. He says, what is frail, finite, limited man that you could be mindful of him? Again, it's a confession of absolutely dumbfounded amazement. Yet amid all the creation of God the Son, Colossians 1.16, that he actively sustains, Colossians 1.17, he has seen fit to look upon the lowly estate of frail humanity and still exalt mankind. We'll see more of that in our third observation from Psalm 8, and that is that God created boundaries and hierarchy among his creation. Verses 5 through 8. I'll read those verses for us. Verse 5 begins, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. That's a reference to man. Verse 6. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the sea, these are all the things that God has placed in subjection to mankind on this earth. Man in the created order is over all the animals. We won't park long here, however. The creation hierarchy affects several things that we will see throughout this podcast series. Even the order in which God created man and woman will play a role as we answer the questions later on, what is marriage? But for now, let's work backwards through these uh, four verses and look at the creation hierarchy. In verses 7 and 8, we have a list of animals, birds, fish, etc. In, in this text, they are the lowest of the creation hierarchy. I would put them in a category called everything else. Okay, They are the rest of God's creation upon the earth. Working backwards to verse 6 and up the rung on the hierarchy ladder, we see that God gave frail man dominion over creation, which includes this list of animals. And then moving back to verse 5, we see that man was made a little lower than the angels. Now, mankind is not subject to angels, nor do, do angels... Uh, possess authority over man in any way, but it is very clear that angels are a higher order of creation, if I can phrase it that way. And then topping everything and topping everyone is the creator, God himself. Yet you, God, have made. God as creator is the top of the order of his creation, obviously so. So to recap from top down, the creator God is the source of all life. And we'll see later on, as creator, that means God has the right, the authority to make the rules. And we're going to see that several times from here on out. Below God, angels and humans are subject to God for purposes of his glory. Revelation 4.11 And angels are a slightly higher order of creation than humans and then humans have great uh, dominion, have been given this great dominion over the rest of creation. Again, this is called the creation mandate. Our fourth basic truth about God and his creation is simply this. God established the responsibilities for mankind. Again, as creator, like I said earlier, he has the right to choose what these responsibilities are. And he established those for mankind. Verse 6, again quickly, you, God, have given man dominion over the works of your hands, over your creation. You have put all things under his feet. The responsibilities of man, therefore, to rule over the earth and manage God's creation could only come from the authority of the creator God himself. And indeed, it did. Number five, God the creator is worthy of glory. You'll see that the beginning of the chapter and the end of the chapter are identical. The chapter begins in verse 1 with this statement, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then the chapter concludes with that same exact phrase in verse 9, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This phrase bookends everything in between, leaving no doubt in our minds that everything contained in between these two identical phrases is the work of and the result of an independent, self-existent God. It is this way, under his authority as creator, 
and is for his glory alone. We can't change that way, uh, nor would we want to, and we'll see that going forward. With that in mind, let me draw some conclusions, and then we'll be done. Number one, my first biblical conclusion, God is the first and final deciding authority of all of mankind's affairs. His authority comes from his creation authority. As we approach this and other topics, we need to understand that God is God and I am not. God is independent. I am very independent. God is the first and final deciding authority of all of mankind's affairs. Man, if we could just grasp this as a church, but also as a society, that we are not our own, we are the result of an intelligent creator, that would just change everything about our lives, about how we live, about what we believe. Number two, God's authority is exercised by his loving care. God is not the God of the deists who created the world, set it in motion, and then has removed himself from it. God has lovingly established rules that are formed in love and for our protection. Again, society does not understand, nor do they care to believe this. But God has lovingly established rules that are informed in love and are for our protection. We are going to choose evil every time. And yet God has established a nature in order, in love. And that order protects us. And by the way, that applies to all humanity, not just believers. There is no distinction in Psalm 8 between believers and unbelievers. The rules that God formed in love are rules for all. Number three, man has a place of exalted honor to reflect the character of God to all creation. Man can reflect the glory of God wherever he is because he bears the image of God. Again, both believers and also unbelievers bear the image of God. Now, God's image in man was marred at creation, but the image of God in man is going to inform a lot of conclusions throughout this study, not the least of which is going to be the topic of race. Moving on, number four, man has been given a place of humility and intrinsic frailty. So even though he's been exalted in honor to reflect God's character to all creation, he has still been given a place of humility and intrinsic frailty. Again, we are not God. We are dependent upon God and answer to him as creator. Again, remember what David said, what is frail, finite, limited man? That's our position. What that does is puts us in a place of subjection under God. It's a place where our faith needs to grow. Number five, man has a responsibility of stewardship over the rest of creation. Uh, Genesis 2, Psalm 8 make that very clear. There's a position of uh, responsibility, uh, stewardship that man has over creation. I don't plan on coming back to this one very much later on, so let's park here for a while. God gave Adam and Eve the creation mandate. Be fruitful, multiply, have authority over creation, subdue it. When sin entered the world, the way the creation mandate looks is different, but did not cease. It surely doesn't seem that way, as far as I can tell. Whether you are on the cutting edge of green innovations or a delivery driver for Domino's Pizza, as humans, we are still responsible for the management of God's creation. Okay, That does not seem to have changed even after the fall. And while we're on the topic, let's get slightly political here for a minute. <laughs> it doesn't matter where your political affiliations or your voting habits lie. If innovational energy sources exist that assist in a managing of this planet... Is there something to be said about Christians supporting those innovations? Sure. Now, I realize there are a lot more at stake in politics than simply going green, minimizing emissions, uh, and all of that. But let's not forget to consider that purpose of our existence on this planet. It is to sustain the planet. It is to manage God's creation. 
uh, can bring in a load of recyclables to the recycling container as opposed to just dumping it all in the landfill or burning it be a way that I can fulfill the creation mandate to manage this earth? Sure. Why not? And our sixth and final conclusion is this. Man lives for the pleasure of his creator. Let me say that again. Man lives for the pleasure of his creator. And on the same hand, our happiness is found in our pursuit of God. I say all this in this session to say that to answer the question of what is a human, we need to begin with who God is. We need to begin with why he created humanity in the first place. And I hope this session on Psalm 8 has helped us in laying some of the foundation. In our next session, we'll be looking a lot more directly at the essence of humanity as we try to determine what God meant when he said, let us create man in our image. Let us create man after our likeness. Exactly how did God create man in his image and his likeness? Well, we'll explore that next time.